Pastor Zach, uh, Shelly and I serve as lead pastors of Connection Point. So glad you're here with us this morning on this snowy Sunday day. We are praying we break that habit by next week. Oh my word, Lord help us. <laughs> uh, we've been talking a, a lot this year about the invitation we've been given to, to follow Jesus. Our guest services have these shirts, you're invited. We've got a, a sign in the lobby, you're invited. And, and that's really what all of us are invited to. And the reason we've been talking so much about this is because the invitation to follow Jesus is the greatest invitation a person can ever be given. The opportunity to be a follower of Jesus is the greatest opportunity any human being has ever been given. And when people get this, when they see the reality of what Jesus offers in life together with him, what have we seen in Luke? People cut holes in ceilings. They lower their friends to see him. Women fight through crowds to touch the the edge of his prayer shawl. In a couple of weeks, we're going to see a guy climb a sycamore tree because he wants to see him. When people understand the life they're offered in Jesus, they want to do everything they can to get to him. The possibility of becoming a disciple of Jesus and living in the reality of his kingdom is the greatest thing any human being can ever be given. And I don't say this slightly. This isn't just pastor talk. I'm serious when I say the greatest invitation you've ever been given in this life, the greatest opportunity you could ever have is to follow Jesus and be his disciple. It is. Every other invitation you could have in this life absolutely pales in comparison. I mean, it's not even a second place. And here's the problem. In the context of our American culture, church buildings and ready access to the Christian faith seem so commonplace, we've missed how incredible the opportunity is we have to follow Jesus. It's so easy for us to take it for granted. And I know this because uh, we lived and served amongst people in North Africa and the Middle East. Hey, we've got some Turkey team members here. If you went to Turkey, do you mind to stand? Who went to Turkey? I saw some of you. They landed at like 1.30 a.m. this morning, and they're here. Well done. (laughs) Holy cow. And I do not envy you the challenges you will have with jet lag this week. (laughs) Oh, man, thanks for going, guys. I can't wait to hear the stories. And when you interact with people, believers from places like Turkey or other places in the Middle East or North Africa, people who don't have ready access to the good news of Jesus, what you find is people truly willing to give up everything and remain steadfast in faith when things don't go right. But it's hard to find people with that kind of mindset in our country. We can face a little persecution and throw up our arms, get loud on social media, participate in marches, and tell everyone how unfair it is that we are challenged for following Jesus in America. It's not okay. The men and women I know from Sudan and the West Bank, they face imprisonment, torture, and even death for their decision to follow Jesus, to wholeheartedly follow him. And they did that not thinking twice about it. Why? Because they just don't take it for granted. They know it's the greatest opportunity they ever have been given in life, and so they run hard after it. I think about Bashar. There's times where I just reflect on these stories sometimes to challenge my faith. Because I'll tell you right now, I haven't figured it out, but I've seen people who have, and it's just like, Jesus, give me faith like those people. Like Bashar, our business administrator in Sudan. So we ran a school in Sudan. Two years after we left from Sudan, uh, it was when we were there, Sudan was one country. We left shortly thereafter. They voted, separated the South from the North. So now there's South Sudan and Sudan, and we lived in Khartoum in the north. And and shortly after that, then Khartoum, the government there, they started to kick out Westerners. They started to seize assets, so vehicles and buildings and anything they could. And, And so then our business administrator, who was a Sudanese national, they imprisoned him, treated him poorly. He was locked up for a very long time. Eventually, he was released and continues to follow Jesus. But he never turned back. He looked at that like an Apostle Paul, the joy of following Jesus to participate in his sufferings. I don't know what we do with passages like that in the New Testament for us. What do we do with that? I think about Muhammad, who lived just north of us in the, in the city where we lived in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And he became a follower of Jesus. People in the community found out because he had formerly been a Muslim. So they came by with a Molokov cocktail, firebombed his business, and it was destroyed. It was gone. How would we react to someone doing that to us? Here's what Muhammad did. 
He took one of those bottles that you use for Molotov cocktails. He wrote a letter, rolled it up, stuck it in the bottle, stuck it on the doorstep of the guy who firebombed his business. And here's what the letter said. I know that you did this to my business. And in our culture, I should have retribution. Eye for an eye. I should go do the same to you. But I want you to know I've become a follower of Jesus. And what Jesus says is I bless those who persecute me. So I bless your home today. I'm going to pray for your family. I'm going to pray for your business. I'm going to pray for you. And I hope Jesus becomes real for you. What kind of faith is that? What kind of faith? A young man, Omar, he's a young adult. He had questions about Jesus. So he went to his sheikh, asking him questions. As he was asking the sheikh this questions about Jesus, the sheikh got so enraged and angry, he just started beating this young man so he would change his mind and stop asking these questions. In the course of beating this young man, he beat him so badly, he killed him. He died of his injuries. The men of that community who had become followers of Jesus, and they formerly had been a part of Hamas, a terrorist organization. So their methods of evangelism, a little bit different than our own, they took that sheikh, bound him in a chair, and basically had him in a garage. So first of all, let me say, I do not encourage evangelism by tying people to chairs and putting them in their garages. (laughs) But that was what they did. They tied him up. They started to talk to him about Jesus. He began to yell back. So then they bound his mouth with tape and they preached Jesus. They preached Jesus for hours. And this man was still angry. So they cast demons out of this man. That was part of his issue. And finally, after hours of preaching Jesus and praying over this man and casting out demons, he just began to weep when he realized what he had done. And he went to that family of that young man and said, forgive me. So sorry. And that family, how do you respond? That family says, it's okay. We know you didn't mean it. We know you didn't know what you were doing. That's Jesus. You you can't say that in your own right. Only the Holy Spirit in you lets you be a follower like that. But I think about those stories. And there are so many I could share. And sometimes I think, where are the men and women of such faith in our country? Where are the men and women of such faith in our community? Where are the men and women of such faith in our church? Because I'll tell you right now, that kind of faith is not reserved for those who live in difficult places. That kind of faith is available to us all. The question is, why aren't we pursuing that kind of faith? That's the kind of Holy Spirit empowerment that we are offered but we sometimes fall short. And I'll say we all do. How can we follow Jesus in a much more wholehearted manner? My prayer is in the coming months and years, I'm telling you, this is the way I'm praying for our community. My prayer is is that we see people of faith like this rise up in our congregation. That we see people of faith like this rise up in our community. People like this of faith rise up in our country that say no matter what comes, I'm gonna follow Jesus and be a light for him. We can have that kind of faith. I want you to have that kind of faith. Jesus has invited you to have that kind of faith. But are you chasing that? You've been given the greatest invitation you've ever been given. Let's not take that invitation for granted. As we continue our series in Luke today, we're going to come across a passage related to what it takes to inherit eternal life. That's a question being asked. We've been given the invitation to live forever with God. That's the invitation. Have you accepted that invitation or are you simply another cultural Christian living in this country, showing up to a church building on Sunday because that's what you've always done? There's so much more offered to us. My prayer is we figure out, ask all of our hearts, examine our hearts. Where do we stand, King Jesus? How am I following you? Can you pass the test of having received eternal life or not? That's the question in our passage. So if you have your Bibles hope you have God's word with you today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18, picking up from where we left off last week in verse 18. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. If you're new to Connection Point, we value reading God's word together. There's a Bible underneath the chair in front of you. You're welcome to borrow that one. Take it home if you don't have one at home. We're going to be in verse 18 today. And I want to mention as we read this, there's no break. So we ended last week with Jesus saying, you must enter the kingdom like a child. 
And so now continuing the conversation today, here's what Luke writes. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. And when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we've left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times over in this time and in the age to come eternal life. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. Last week, we talked about coming alive by humbly approaching God. That is our posture before God, that we can humbly approach him. And many of you, as we closed in song, said, I want to humbly approach God to be able to receive all that he has for me. May we humbly approach God. You see, it's easy to sleepwalk through life, to simply go through the motions, working a job, paying bills, raising a family, showing up at a church building on Sunday mornings. And if we're not careful, we can wind up living without ever really coming alive. But that's not what God wants for you. We can live life sleepwalking instead of being fully alive, experiencing everything that God has for us. We can miss the opportunity to step into the extraordinary life that Jesus offers if we're not careful. So the question is, will you humbly approach God, put your full and complete faith in him, receive his mercy and experience all he has for you in this life and on into eternity? Will you approach him like a child? Jesus said, you must in order to live in his kingdom. And this must have created an interesting challenge in the heart of the wealthy and powerful man who was in the crowd that day. Because right after Jesus makes this statement, we find from our passage this morning that a person of great means, he follows up the statement of Jesus with this question. What must one do to inherit eternal life? In other words, here's what the rich and powerful man was asking. If one must be like a child to enter the kingdom... What are the implications for me, a wealthy and powerful man? How can I too enter the kingdom and inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him an answer. And the first part of the answer is, we inherit eternal life by being a Christian as Jesus defines it. We inherit eternal life by being a Christian as Jesus defines it. After the man asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life, here's what Jesus says. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And what Jesus is doing is he's pointing back to the law as it's found in the Old Testament books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. He's referring to those commandments that reveal our need to love others well. Again, we've been talking about loving Jesus, loving others. Everything can be summed up in that. What Jesus is saying is to inherit eternal life, you must love others well. That's what he's describing for this man. And why is that? Because God does. God loves you. God loves the person sitting next to you. God loves your neighbors. God loves your boss. God loves your coworkers. God loves the grocery clerk that you're checking out with. God loves the people you interact with on a daily basis. And this understanding should actually shape the way that we define Christianity. To be a Christian, what it should be is to be like Jesus Christ. To do what he says. To be a mini Christ. That's what a Christian is. And the word Christ, if we think about being like Jesus Christ, Christ means Messiah or the anointed one. So to be a Christian is to carry the anointing of Jesus everywhere you go. That's what the Holy Spirit does. 
You're the temple, it says, that the Holy Spirit has filled you and you carry his anointing with you. To be a Christian is to believe in Jesus and do what he says. Here's a summary I can give you. To be a Christian is to live and look like Jesus. That's what a Christian is. But the problem is, our American Christian culture has not really defined Christianity in this way. By our standards, we might say a Christian is somebody who believes Jesus was divine, that he was the son of God, and that his death on the cross will save you and you will go to heaven when you die. It's a pretty generic description. In other words, for the most part, our definition of Christianity is simply tied to beliefs. But I want to say, beliefs are very, very important. But being a Christian was never meant to stop there. Because if Christianity stops at beliefs, we fall short of truly living and looking like Jesus. This is why people like Gandhi can look at the life of someone who calls himself a Christian and say, Jesus is ideal and wonderful, but you Christians are not like him. And how many people in our world today could still say the same thing of so-called Christians in our country? Jesus is ideal and wonderful, but you Christians are not like him. We've been working through Luke together and we've been seeing that Jesus asks much of people. I've told Shelley in the last month, so if you've been here in our series on Luke, I forewarned you last January, like now that we're gonna get to Luke chapter nine and Jesus sets his face on Jerusalem, what you find is the closer he gets to the cross, the more pointed he gets in his conversations. And I told Shelley, I'm like, I'll be honest, this is tough stuff. <laughs> like this is, whoo, it's, it's interesting to evaluate what Jesus is asking of us. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. So I've been reflecting on these things. And, and so as I share these things, know that I'm wrestling with them too. So I went to this last week, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Because I was curious. You know, that's the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we find a lot of the commands of Christ. And I thought, what does he command? Prayer, giving, fasting, bless those who persecute you. All that stuff is in there. So really good stuff. And we can evaluate, well, how am I doing, Jesus, with what you have to say? Because as we look at the life of Jesus, he doesn't just ask people to believe he's the son of God. Read the Gospels. This is not what he tells the rich man. Jesus also tells him to do something. In other words, here's how Jesus defines Christianity. Believing everything he says and doing what he tells us to do. It's in our passage today. It's all over the rest of Luke. It's all over the New Testament. In other words, Christianity is both believing in who Jesus is, which also then implies we're going to do what he says. Jesus says, follow me, become my disciple, and as you do, you will carry an anointing on your life that others will recognize, confirming that you belong to my kingdom. Now, I also want to say, I... I know when I say Christianity is both believing and doing, I'm fully aware that some people might ask, well, does that mean I have to earn my salvation? Is there something I have to do to earn my way to heaven? And the simple answer is no. The fact is you cannot earn your way to heaven. Let me be clear on that this morning. Jesus actually addresses that in this passage because people ask him, well, then who can be saved? Because Jesus said it's difficult for those with wealth to enter the kingdom. And here's what Jesus says. What's impossible with man is possible with God. It is impossible for us to earn salvation. Jesus makes salvation. Salvation is in Jesus. But then the question is, well, if salvation is just in Jesus, then why does he tell the rich man to sell all his stuff? And that leads us to our next point about inheriting eternal life, that we inherit eternal life by removing distractions from following Jesus. This is what Jesus is doing. We inherit eternal life by removing distractions from following Jesus. I already shared a few weeks back our need to remove distractions from our life. And from our passage today, after Jesus tells the man, you must obediently follow God in order to inherit eternal life, the man says, great, already done. In other words, I'm a good Jew. I already follow the law. So he was excited about that. But then Jesus tells him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. The tension in this passage is this. Will this man prefer what earth can give him 
or what heaven offers? That's the tension. And that's the question all of us need to answer. Will we prefer what earth can give us or what heaven offers? Jesus wants to know if this man's faith is in the things of earth or in the way of God. Where does our faith lie? And what happens? But when he heard these things, the rich man, when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. And Jesus goes on to say, well, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. This man was great, given the greatest invitation in life, but he became sad, preferring what earth could give over what heaven was offering. What a tragedy. And what's really frightening is how easy it is for all of us to choose earth over heaven. It's very easy. And this is the difference be, be, between being a Christian as Jesus defines it or being a Christian as our culture defines it. True followers of Jesus, they choose him over everything else. That's what it is to follow him. Cultural Christians, on the other hand, they might believe in Jesus, wanting to go to heaven, but they don't really follow everything he has to say. The challenge for us in our nation is the good news has largely been presented as a costless addition to one's life. Simply add church going to your hobbies, add charitable giving to your list of good deeds, or add the cross as a wall hanging in your home, and now you're a Christian by American standards. And in this way, a lot of American Christians simply go through the motions of accepting Jesus with no real accompanying surrender to his lordship. And people live this way because they're seeking to adhere to the minimum amount of believing or doing required to inherit eternal life. The question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is still being asked today. And it's being asked in the same way. Because what was the rich man asking? Here's what he was really asking. Jesus, what is the minimum amount I must do or believe to be assured I will inherit eternal life? And this is the same question being asked by a lot of American Christians today. What's the minimum amount I must do or believe to be assured I will inherit eternal life? And people might not verbalize that question with their mouths, but they're asking this question in the way that they live their lives. And here's the problem. Jesus never says, read the Gospels, he never says, now I will tell you the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. People would love that answer, right? Everybody's looking now. <laughs> you aren't going to find it. Jesus never expresses Christianity in this way. I, I want you to think about that question if asked in a different way in the context of our lives. I'm going to ask Shelly to help me with the, this illustration this morning. We welcome her. She comes. Sometimes I feel bad because she has to participate in some of these crazy things. Thanks for being a willing participant. So Shelly and I got married 19 years ago. And in December, yeah, that's worth applying, sure. They're applauding your ability to be married to me for 19 years. That's great. <laughs> so a little bit more than 19 years ago, my last year in college, it was Christmas break. I invited Shelly to come visit our family. We were living in Chicago at the time. Shelly was living in Tennessee near Nashville area. I said, hey, come up. I've planned a fun date for us. You love the ballet. Let's go see the Nutcracker, Joffrey Ballet, Auditorium Theater. You've ever been in it. It's a beautiful theater. My, uh, I've got two older sisters. One of them has, was working in Chicago. She helped me secure some nice tickets, tickets like box seats, you know, like an usher showing us the way. So we're 22. What do 22 year olds know, you know? And we're just feeling, huh? 21. Yeah, I don't, we were kids. <laughs> it was just, it was awesome. But, you know, before the ballet, we were going to go to a nice dinner. But before a nice dinner, I first went to the planetarium. I felt like this would be a great place to propose to Shelly. Cold, wintry night, Chicago skyline in the background, snowing a little bit. You could almost hear music in the background. <laughs> It was awesome. So I gave Shelly a present, gave her some ballet slippers. She loves a ballet. So that was the early Christmas present. Gave her a card, had a great poem in it. The last stanza I left out, which was where I was going to ask her to marry me. So she's got this card. I'm reading it to her. And there's, 
only one other couple out of the planetarium that night. One. They're over here somewhere. Well, as I'm going through this card, I know where this is going. <laughs> they start walking up. The guy does. I'm just like, no. <laughs> I get to the last stand, so the guy comes up. Would you mind to take our picture? <laughs> I'll be right back. I got nothing else going on. Sure, I'll take your picture. Take their picture, Chicago Skyline, fantastic. Now I can get back, finish the last stanza of the poem, get down on one knee, my ballerina bride, to me you'll always be. My heart's desire and only question is, will you marry me? So that's the poem. She said yes. I said, please say yes again, by the way. <laughs> but what if, what if instead I would have said, my ballerina bride, to me I hope you'll be. My heart's desire and only question is, what are the minimal requirements expected of me? I tell you what, my then 6'4", 220 pound frame would have been nothing for 5'4", 120 firecracker. Ballerina slippers in hand, she's like, I hope you're hungry, you're going to eat these, you know? Thanks, Joe. Because what am I saying when I'm asking that question? I don't really want to marry you. I just think marriage is a fun idea. You know, so what do you think? What's it going to take? What do I got to do? Minimum requirements. Who asks that question? Who wants a minimum marriage? I don't. I want to know how do I maximize my life with Shelly as a spouse, as a parent, and every other avenue of my life. But that's what it is when you approach Jesus. And asked this, this was a wrong question. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What he should have asked is, how can I maximize my life in you, Jesus? And Jesus gave him the answer. Because Jesus doesn't even answer the question he's asking. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What does Jesus say? One thing you still lack, sell everything that you have. And what's he say? He doesn't say, and then you'll inherit eternal life. He says, come follow me. The gift I give to you is a personal relationship with me. That's the greatest invitation we've ever been given. That's the opportunity of a lifetime for us. So why in the world have we approached Christianity with a minimum life instead of my maximum life in Jesus? Jesus, help us. Help us see what you have offered us. We're asking the wrong question. Think about it. When I ask Shelly this question, <laughs> she says yes, but if I were to ask the minimum question, I'm not getting married that day. Chicago police are finding me on the Lakeshore Drive the next morning. Probably not alive. We must stop asking the question, what is the minimum amount I must do or believe to be assured I will inherit eternal life? We have to start asking the question, how can I better follow Jesus and best represent him to the lost and dying world in which I live? We have to stop asking the question, what's the minimum amount I must do or believe to be assured I'll inherit eternal life? And start asking, what can I do to maximize my life in Jesus and advance his kingdom, fulfill his big dream? We can no longer be cultural Christians asking uh, minimum questions. We've got to start being disciple makers who ask maximizing questions. I don't want to live a minimum life. I want to live a maximum life. How about you? Here's something important to understand. There was no such thing as cultural Christianity in the days of the early church. The early disciples, they were following Jesus. They were learning that he was the son of God. Jesus revealed this to him. The Holy Spirit reveals it to them. And they were doing what he said. And either you were doing that as his disciple or you just weren't following him. There's no middle ground there. Early church, Acts 2 community, said that they met daily for the breaking of bread, fellowship in their homes for prayer. They would come together, they would gather every day. And so early church, either you were doing that, you were in the community, or you weren't. It was really clear. There was no middle ground. But what happened? Over the next few hundred years, Christianity spread to the point where the majority of people in the Roman Empire were believers in Jesus, but the way of life got so diluted, people started to seek the minimum instead of the maximum. That's what started happening. Peter, and I include him this morning because he's in our passage asking, well, Jesus, have we done it? And here's what he's going to later write in the New Testament. He says, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners, this is a temporary place for us. 
Eternity is what's been offered to us. And what's he say? Keep away from worldly desires. I wonder if he had the rich man in mind when he wrote this. Keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. When Jesus asks this rich man to sell all and follow him with the promise of treasure in heaven, he's asking the man to become a citizen of heaven. Jesus knows this man's earthly possessions will serve as a barrier to genuine followership. And so Jesus is trying to lead this man so that he can get that barrier out of the way. And what barriers do we have in our lives that are keeping us from the maximum life that Jesus offers? When we become citizens of heaven, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Man, wonderful songs. Turn your eyes to Jesus. When we become citizens of heaven, our resources cease to be ours. Instead, they become tools of heaven in order to serve him. Only when we have a sense of detachment from the things of earth can we give our all to God. And this is why Jesus encourages this rich man to rid himself of the very thing that will keep him from fully following him and thereby inheriting eternal life. Because to inherit eternal life, we must wholeheartedly follow Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. So I encourage you, stop living a life that asks Jesus what the minimum is to inherit eternal life. Sign up for the next step class. It's offered next week so that you can start being led. How do I step onto the path that leads to a maximum life? Our desire is to lead you in wholehearted devotion to the only one who can grant you eternal life. So don't live an ordinary life. Live an extraordinary one. We inherit eternal life by removing distractions that keep us from following Jesus wholeheartedly. And I'll say this, it is possible. So let me say this, it is possible to live like this. It is possible to fully and eternally live with Jesus. Because maybe after talking about wholehearted devotion, maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure it's even possible to live like this. I'm not even sure it's possible to inherit the eternal life that God offers. But what does Jesus say? What's impossible with man is possible with God. So we can't do it on our own, but God has granted it to us in Jesus, his son. And after Jesus makes a statement, here's what Peter says, basically asking Lord, well, Lord, we've left our homes and followed you. Like, have we done it? Because they want to be in the kingdom. They want to inherit eternal life. And what does Jesus say? Yes. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, they'll be repaid many times over in this life and have eternal life in the world to come. In other words, it is possible to follow Jesus like this and be the kind of Christian that he expects. Why? Because the grace of God makes it possible. The Holy Spirit living in you helps you to both believe in who Jesus is and do what he says. The Holy Spirit in you can make you do it, help you do it. After it becomes clear, the rich man cannot follow Jesus like he asked. Peter asked Jesus if they had done it. That's what he's asking. And Jesus assured him he had. So what does it mean? It is possible to take one's heart, place it into the welfare, into God's tender, loving care. We can do that. We can trust God. You can follow Jesus this way. You can be a great man or woman of God with incredible faith that can bless those who persecute you. Absolutely, you can be that kind of person. God wants you to have that kind of faith. Jesus tried to get the rich man to give this kind of trust, but he couldn't. Peter and the other disciples, on the other hand, they had trusted in Jesus like this, and in so doing, they joined that family of fellow travelers who honor God. That's what they did. They gained far more than anything else that they've gave up for him. That's what Jesus says. So the question this morning is, is are you among those travelers? Are you among those who both believe and do? If not, become that kind of follower today. Become a Christian as Jesus defines it. So the question this morning on the back of your program is we want to help you with those I will statements. As you listen to the message, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's your I will statement? In response to this message, I will, what is that answer going to be this morning? Believe in Jesus and do what he says. This is what it means to be a follower of his, to be a disciple. This is what it means to be a Christian. And this is how you inherit eternal life. We can, you can, I can live fully and eternally with Jesus. It's possible. Jesus says that it is. It's possible because of what God has done. 
When Jesus came to earth, everything in our world changed. The kingdom of God invaded our world in his life, in his teachings, in his death on the cross for our evil hearts. And in his resurrection, the kingdom of God has broken into the earth in a way that now makes it accessible for everyone. Jew and Gentile, male and female, rich and poor, slave or free, and anybody who wants to come right in to live in the kingdom. It's accessible to us all. And the way that you do this is by becoming a disciple, knowing it's the greatest opportunity of your life. Saying, I don't want to miss this. No matter what the cost is, I must have this. A disciple is someone who says, I must have the reality of the good news of Jesus and his promises in my life from now. That's what a disciple says. And you do this not to earn your way into heaven when you die, but because being a disciple is intrinsically connected to the good news of Jesus. Will you become a wholehearted follower today? And maybe you've listened to this message today and you feel a bit overwhelmed at the thought of, doing all the things Jesus commanded us to do as his disciples. But my encouragement would be, don't be overwhelmed. All you need to do is do the right next thing you know to do. That's it. If you do that, you'll do well. Do the next right thing you know to do. You probably have a semblance if you've read God's word at all. And if you haven't, start in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. That's be a good place to start. Jesus tells us some things to do. Just do the next right thing you know to do. That's it. Don't be overwhelmed by it. And as you do that, you'll be on the path that leads to both believing and doing and inheriting eternal life. What kind of difference could you make in your neighborhood and workplace if you began to do the next right thing you need to do? How much different could your life be if you began to both believe in who Jesus is and to do what he asked us to do? How could you come alive if you stopped living the minimum, began to live the maximum life you're offered in Jesus? What could your life look like? You won't know until you make the decision to start doing the next right thing you know to do. So make that decision today. I invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. And as you're standing, some of you today, the the next right thing you need to do is just make that simple decision to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. That rich man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But the better question is, Jesus, how can I follow you? Because if you follow Jesus by believing in who he is and doing what he says, Jesus says you inherit eternal life. Are you secure in that today? Maybe today you'd say, well, I'm not, but I'd like to be. So I want to make that decision today to follow him. If you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I was going back through that right away at chapter 5. It, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So what's the entry point? Oh God, I realize my spiritual poverty. And as you recognize your spiritual poverty and give that over to God, Jesus says, and yours is the kingdom. And then the next one, oh, blessed are those who mourn over the sin in their lives, for they shall be comforted. The Holy Spirit comforts you. So you mourn over sin. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the meek. He says, blessed are the pure of heart. So what happens as you go through this process, you become pure of heart. And then the promise there is you get to see God. That's the promise of all of scripture. We, Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. We go back to Revelation and God says, we read it last week, I will be their God, they will be my people, be my children. We're going back to him. But what he says is in this in-between time, follow me, you'll get glimpses. You'll get a taste of it, taste of heaven. Do you have that in your life? With every head bowed in this room, you'd say, I wanna follow Jesus like that. I wanna, I recognize my spiritual poverty. I, I understand there's this mourning over sin. So if that's where you find yourself today, and you'd say, I wanna follow Jesus like that. Just raise your hand and I wanna pray with you before we leave. Anybody would say, that's me. I wanna follow Jesus. Over here on the right, anybody else that would say, that's me. Here in the middle, anybody else? Say, I wanna follow Jesus like that. Over here on the left, Anybody else? Believe in who Jesus is. Do what he says. Inherit eternal life. That's the promise from today. That's the promise of Jesus. And that which you give up pales in comparison to what you get in return. God, I just thank you for those that responded this morning. And Lord, I just pray that you would come into their lives fully today. Lord, as they recognize their spiritual poverty, the promise is theirs is the kingdom. They've entered into the kingdom. Lord, as they mourn over sin, you're going to comfort them by your Holy Spirit. Lord, as they start to walk in your ways, pure of heart, and they get to see you, they get to taste a bit of heaven today. So God, I just pray they'd live in that. God, help us 
to be able to lead these individuals well. Lord, they make that decision alone, but we don't leave them there. We rally around them to say, you've made the best decision of your life and we're excited for you today. And so God, we pray that you would firm in their hearts this desire to follow you. And Lord, I pray that they'd have the boldness to step out to say, and I wanna know how do I follow Jesus for a lifetime? And Lord, for all of us in this room, help us to examine our hearts as we close in song. Lord, we all fall short. That's, that's not the problem. But may we understand that we can follow you and we need to do the next right thing. Yes, we need to believe in who you are, but we need to, through that belief, begin to see the fruit of doing what you say. Help us in that way, Lord. Show us any barriers that we've got in our lives that are keeping us from wholeheartedly following you. And may we turn those over to you today. It's all yours, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If I can invite a couple of prayer team members to come down here this morning, Pastor Mark is, is not here for this service. Uh, we've had a couple of people raise their hands. And if you didn't raise your hand today, but you wanna know how do I follow Jesus for a lifetime, as we close in song, we're just gonna encourage you to step out from where you're at, come down and meet with one of our prayer team members. They'll give you a Bible and information on how you follow Jesus for a lifetime. We don't leave you alone in that decision. We want to partner with you. Can we celebrate those that raised our hand today? <laughs> prayer team members are, are taking those individuals out. But if you want to come forward, we've got some other prayer team members. If you want to make that decision, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you say, man, I, I can't walk out of here without saying yes to Jesus. And for the rest of us, as we sing, we're singing, my heart is yours. May you begin to examine, oh Lord, if there's any area in my life that I haven't surrendered to you, make it known to me that I might wholeheartedly follow you, not living the minimum life in you, but the maximum life I'm offered in you. Let's give all things over to the Lord today.